looking for something that wasn't there. That kind of typifies what you were talking about earlier. It's second down and 10. Yeah, he seems to be doing a little bit more of that this year for some reason. Now, maybe the coaches are asking him to kind of pick and look for his holes. I think last year when he was making all that yardage, he was making one decision and going for it and picking up four yards on play like that. Now it looks like he might be trying to make too many big plays. He had 10 consecutive 100-yard games last year after the first two. He has not had a 100-yard game yet this year. He's got 15 seconds plus a quarter left if need be, but his club is leading 30 to nothing, so that's not likely. Osgood's pass toward the corner. It's caught by Waddle. Waddle at the six-yard line. Great pass, great catch. and goal for A&M with four seconds to go in the quarter. Let's take a look at it now. Osgood does a great job of laying this over the outside shoulder. Gets it up high enough. Waddle with his six foot one height. You can see him go up over the top of the defensive back and makes the catch. Just a great concentration by Waddle. And as they put the chains in place, the clock rolls out. We have reached the end of period three with the score, Texas A&M 30, TCU nothing. This one was a sparkler. Oh, he just does a good job. Look at the concentration. Look at his eyes. Look at his face. Now, he times it. He jumps high in the air. You see the defensive back didn't have a chance. The right 5'10 didn't have a chance the way Waddle went up and brought that one down. That's just great receivership play there. He went up, concentrated all the way, timed his jump up. 112 yards. Happy time on the sideline. And the first one to congratulate Osgood was Pavlos between the quarters. He went down the sideline. Pavlos was the first one there to... Congratulate Osgood on a good, on a well-timed pass. Waddle is a senior from Columbus, Texas, located about 70 miles west of Houston. I-10, here's the first and goal, and Osgood gets it maybe a yard closer. Second and goal from the four. Osgood was a transfer from Ole Miss, where he was a starter. Looks like they're going to make some of those offensive linemen work and lose a few pounds tonight to get get that number one offensive line still in there. And right about now, they're probably sucking a little wind down on that field. Fourth quarter just underway. We've played about 30 seconds. It's second and goal for the Ags. Lewis is dotting the eye. And he's got the pitch, and he's going to lose a yard or two. Robert McWright. The cornerback on the right side coming through to make the stop. It'll be third and goal from the six. Right. I would think that uh, TCU really anticipated the option here. Watch, it, watch the pitcher as he goes down. Watch him throw this ball almost down. His knee was almost down. And, of course, McWright played it well outside there. He was just waiting for the pitch man. And Lewis didn't have a chance on that play. How about that? Lane Talbert's the first Aggie kicker to make three field goals in one game since Scott Slater in 1987. Well, Slater was a good one. Yep. Oh, he's got time. He's got time, and Osgood will take it to the one. Boy, he had a lot of time, but he couldn't find a receiver. He had a man in front of him open, you may have seen, but if you weren't worth watching the number, that was a lineman. He couldn't throw it to him. Well... Shall we go for the fourth and maybe look up some other records on the phone? <laughs> well, you know, it's one of these deals that, you know, you talk about score and everything. You don't you don't really kick a field goal here. You're ahead 30 to nothing. Right. Tough decision from yeah. a coach's standpoint to our friends. Yeah. You know, if you kick the field goal, it looks like you're rubbing it in. If you go for it, it looks like you're trying to pour points on. So you're, you're in almost in a no-win situation coaching-wise. Well, the ball is on the one. It's fourth and goal from the one. Wilson and Lewis the backs. Lewis, touchdown, Texas A&M. Three touchdowns for Lewis. The Aggies up to 36 points. And rolling to an easy victory. anyone anticipated it being this kind of a, a game this evening. Now, the Aggies were favored in the game, but by less than two touchdowns. And there's 
the extra point. It's perfect, and that makes it 37 for Texas A&M, 30 for TCU, 12 minutes and 40 seconds to play in the ball game at Eamon Carter Stadium. 10.30 delayed as the Baylor Bears travel to the Astrodome to face the Houston Cougars. And that, on paper, would uh, seem to be an interesting tussle. And we'll certainly see on October 7th. A tussle, huh? At least. Brad Gable, the record-setting quarterback for Baylor, against the record-setting offense for Houston. That won't be returned. You know, one player we have not mentioned tonight, and we got to mention him, not that he was going to make a 37-point difference, but he makes a difference. Tony Darthard has not been able to play for TCU. He underwent knee surgery less than a week ago and uh, arthroscopic surgery. He will not be out for the year. They expect him back in two or three weeks, but he's an outstanding running back, and TCU's going to miss him. Yeah, he is a good player. You're absolutely correct. 63-yard drive. That's the Aggies' longest. But it uh, also started on a fumble. <laughs> They've got one field goal and four touchdowns following turnovers. Not much there. Corey Ford with the carry. And Lewis with the tackle. Some of the fans making their way out of the area. 12 minutes and 34 seconds left. Well, Aggies are going to be penalized. They had 12 men on the field that play. The famous did, 12th they, man. Huh? They, they really didn't need 12. I mean, they've been doing pretty good with 11. But I think he's trying to get some substitutes in there. And maybe one of those players who hadn't played much wanted to get in the game. Can't blame him for that, can you? No, no. He can always lay claim to being one of the Aggies' famous 12th men. That face kind of tells it all, doesn't yeah, it? That's on the TCU sideline. Moving the ball all the way up to the 35. Next 12 minutes and 34 seconds will not be a fun time on that TCU sideline. For the Aggies, what uh, what depth they have been able to bring, and of course you don't have as many people suited up on a road game as you do on a home game, so what depth they have been able to bring, we'll see action. Giles drops back again. Intercepted. Derek Frazier, a redshirt freshman from Sugarland Clemens High School, makes the interception. And turns it back over. That is number seven. Old Derek was an all-district quarterback when he played high school football down there in Clemens. Sitting back there in his own coverage now, just looking for things like this to happen. He reads it well, steps up, right into his hands. Actually, the ball was underthrown a bit over his head while it might have been a completion. Now yeah, let's spot and see who the Aggies have in. Now, again, they've scored a great deal because of turnovers after turnovers. The three touchdowns today is Osgood drops back to throw and leaves it short. The three touchdowns tonight by Lewis, a career high for one game. He hasn't had a lot of rushing yards, 46, 45, but he does have the three touchdowns. Well, he does have Greg Cook in there, one of the offensive linemen now. That's a tough situation from R.C. standpoint because it's only the third game of the year and it's early in the season and you really want to get your team playing together and, and getting the timing on many things and offensive line wise there is a penalty on the flag. The flag is down. This is a statistic that has really had a bearing on the game. <laughs> they had the delay of the game. Evidently had an extra men on the field that time again. When you've only got to go 50 yards and you cut that 100 yard field in half you're going to be able to score a little bit. Aggies were penalized again for having that 12th men on the field. Well, it's a tradition at A&M. Well, maybe some of the band members are trying to slip out there. <laughs> Seven turnovers yep. to none. That's I think the none is also a significant factor. They have given TCU nothing, and TCU has not been able to take anything. So the scoreboard is 37 to none. Good with 
Max beat, but they maybe didn't beat the clock. Now what's wrong? Hell, if they score on this drive, it's going to be the longest of the night. <laughs> Legal motion. It's still first down. Well, yeah, they've got some folks in there that haven't been playing and anxious to move and get going and timing a little bit different from the quarterback standpoint. Another fellow tonight, Ed, that's had a career high is Percy Waddle. Five catches, 112 yards, longest 47, 112 yards for number 81. Well, it is first and 30. Middle screen. Shane Garrett. Garrett was met by Crump just as he caught the ball. Uh, Crump read this, this screen. They've run this a couple of times. I was going to catch it this time and go back to the outside, but Crump read it from the free safety position. It just came up there and timed it up well. Good player. Six foot three, 210 pound junior. Pretty heavy safety to be banging you that hard. It is second down and now 33. Garrett this time uh, tackled by Crump after a big game. They're still a ways from the first down. Yeah, they did a great job of reading that zone coverage and Garrett just moved inside, split the linebackers underneath the secondary and Osgood delivered it. They got 17 yards on the pass play and it's third down and 16. spot. Oliver says he got it. He puts the ball down about a yard in front of where they're going to put it. It's close, though. And it's the same situation as before. Uh, don't really kick a field goal here. It is going to be short of the first down. Well, you've got to go. You have to go for it on yeah. the first down. And again, this is right down the middle. Oscar's got an arm. He can drill that ball. And actually, it looks like he caught the ball a little bit farther down where they made the final spot. Well, the mistake he made was I think he placed it back too far. And of course, <laughs> they're going to move it back. They're not going to let you do that. And they moved it back maybe too far. Anyway, it's fourth, though. And now they want a timeout. Aggies called a timeout as he was racing off to the sideline. Shane Garrett heard the word from the bench, and so he signaled for time. Uh, Bob Polito wants to make something straighten up. Ten minutes and one second to play in a ball game, and the Aggies have led all the way. And it's 37 to nothing right now. He, he could re reset himself. The end, the end could move. They moved it back five, yeah. and now it's fourth and five. They gave him the penalty, but again, now they're going to punt. RC is unhappy with that kind of mistake. See? Gravity him saying, and not, he's telling him in nice, kind words that you won't make five yards all year. Look what you did to us. <laughs> not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> but, but you really got to get their attention when they make, you know, that's just a mental mistake, and you hate to see that happen. You know, Shane Craw will remember that. Sean Wilson's punt goes into the end zone, and it'll come back out to the 20 yard line. And there's a flag. We got a wrestling match back at the 35. Between a couple of players, now more than a couple, so the flag is thrown. Well, the AM coaches did a good job of making sure their guys didn't come back, and a little frustration going on. That's all that is when you're behind 37 nothing in the fourth quarter. You get, you have a tendency to get frustrated. I doubt whether this will call will be either way. This well, is one, one of them the official setting. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that's just a little frustrating. Well, we'll find out. Lloyd Dale, the referee, will make a call. Look at this. 42,960, the fifth largest crowd ever at Eamon Carter Stadium. It is a 46,000 capacity stadium, and we're that close to full. Well, the Aggies have brought a lot of folks with them. They, yeah, they follow their team. 
Look at the size of that. Well, that's well, a nice Fred pack. Washing. Oh, it's really washing. not that big. That's a nice. <laughs> don't get don't get excited. That's a nice pack there, right on the outside of that. That's Freddie Washington. Keep the, keep the swelling from coming out too bad. <laughs> that makes it look like you've got a a real ankle there. Freddie played a strong game, but it wasn't strong enough because his team was uh, really he, having to defend their backyard the whole game. They he, were backed up to their own goal line. He seemingly. played well, though. He played well. First down. Ball finally spotted at the 20. Reverse. Hey, little whoopsie dipsy. He can go all the way on this one. This one can go all the way. Toby Moore, yeah. Moore made this 80 yards if he does. Nope, going to be yeah. cut down to about the 28-yard line. Toby Morey, who is actually a wide receiver, a sophomore transfer, sat out last year from Red Oak, Texas. Moved the ball all the way down inside Aggie territory to about the 27. There it is. You see him come down the line, makes a little pitch behind him, ladder behind him to him. Now he's got great running room out there. That lineman out of his way and said, get on there and get somebody. He's going to outrun him. Look at this point that he's going to go all the way, but I'll tell you, some defensive backs on across the field for AM show their speed right there to cut him off the pass. 53 yards for Morey. And he suddenly becomes the top rusher in the game by a huge margin for TCU, but leaving the game. Yeah, this, this ankle happened when he collided with another AM player. Take a look at number 10 or 8, Bradbury, right here. Watch, watch where he'd slide right here. He's going to. Get around here. And now watch him collide with number three. And that's where he gets his ankle. They, they put their feet up right there. Look at that. He got his ankle twisted up right there. Got him off stride. Ran into Derek Frazier. First down play. And the tight end, Blackwell, makes the catch and is brought down to about the 13-yard line. Blackwell, really, because of his skill at catching the football, pretty much forced Ben Griffith, the offensive coordinator, to include the tight end as part of this triple shoot. Normally with an offense of this nature, you don't have a tight end as such. Now, Blackville admittedly is more of a pass catcher, but they do use a tight end formation more than perhaps Griffith originally had planned when he tried to put this together. It's first down. Uh-oh, there's another. The ball is saved, oh. however. Wow, I'll tell you, they're just having a lot of trouble. Corey Ford fell on it. AM got some secondary people in there. Derek Ritchie is in there, number 22. We'll have some different folks and give them a chance to have some opportunity to show up. Palmer checks in. Jeff Shanks is in there, defensive lineman. Eric Moore, defensive back, is in there. Frazier is in there, number three. Stephen Shipley is wide left. Giles is minus nine on 16. Oh, he just got rid of that because he got in your face defense by Trent Lewis. He really blasted through on Giles. He just had to unload, hoping that someone would be in the corner of the end zone. He's from Huntsville. Looks like they just let him out of prison. Well, he came up through there. Freshman red shirt. Look at him come up through there. Boom. And Giles saw him coming, too. Six foot three, 236 pounds. He'd like to be, how, how'd you like to have that hitting you in the face as a quarterback? He just heaved it to the end zone corner, hoping that the receiver could get to wherever the ball was going to land, and that was not possible. There is the big fella, Lewis, who made that move. It is now third and about 14. Giles again lost it to the end zone. And oh, intercepted. intercepted in the end zone by Derek Frazier with one hand. Giles is tossed, but I'll tell you, credit the great play by Frazier on this one. You'll never see a better interception than this one. One hand in the end zone. Look at this. One hand, tips it, watches it all the way in. Great job by Frazier. Again, watch this. Watch the one hand. Great camera work by our people. Look at this. Right on the fingertip, juggles it, they concentrate, brings it in as he falls down. Derek Frazier. What a play. He was a red shirt last year. 
And as I said earlier, he was a quarterback at Clemens in high school, which shows you what kind of athletes they have. I mean, all these schools, they put, put that usually that best athlete at quarterback. He smiles about that one. You deserve to smile. Well, Derek closes out what was TCU's best shot of getting on the scoreboard. Eight minutes and eight seconds to play, 37 to nothing, Texas a and And another turnover. They got to have more turnovers in the Baker shop for tonight. <laughs> Write that one down. That's eight. But the, the eight to nothing, the nothing part, the comparison is what to me is incredible because the Aggies have thrown the ball a lot and they've not turned it over. McAfee with short yardage up to about the 22. Couple yard gain. Well, the Aggies just want to keep that clock running now and get out of here without getting any more injuries. They passed for 16 for 23 as a team. Pavlo said Osgood for, oh, 255 yards. Running attack hasn't been as potent, but it's mixed in well. Second down at eight. McAfee with very close to the first down. Depends on where the knee went down. Ivory Christian, the should be should be a first down if it touches the line. Yes, first down. Ivory Christian, who made the tackle number 93, is not even 19 years old yet. Very young freshman from Odessa Permian. First down. Clock running, 7.14 to play. And off up the middle. And again, only about a yard gain. Doug Carter in there on that play, I believe. They got a lot of second or third people in there for the Aggies right now. Carter's the man who made the carry. Second down. Gary Pinson's in there as a wide receiver, number 19. Number 13, Brian Edwards. Carter's a sophomore from Dallas, number 32. Now that one didn't, didn't work. McAfee had no room. And it'll be third down and more than 10 now. Keith Alex, a big sophomore offensive lineman from Beaumont Central. Six foot six, 305 pounders. McAfee's pretty big, 209 for a quick runner. It is third down and 11. Nearing the six minute mark. Aggies want to be able to control the ball by grinding it out on the ground, but they're not going to be able to get a first down on a pass. It's tipped and incomplete. Fourth down. The Aggies will kick it away. Right now, TC is just trying to salvage something. They've four out of 16 on uh, third down conversions, but again, it hasn't been important. Well, they had East because they've been so close. Well, TCU has had 16 possessions. This will be their 17th, Greg. And eight of them, they've turned the ball over to the Aggies. And that's just, you just can't play winning football when you do that. And Jim Wack will be very concerned about that stat. Robert McWright, the ball still loose. And finally down at about the two-yard line. Boy, McWright took that one with his midsection. He really got through. Well, you got to figure the odds are pretty good at TCU at least salvaging the embarrassment of being shut out now. They've got the ball first and goal inside the three. First A&M turnover. Just come from the outside. Boy, that ball bounces around. They all... They all want to pick it up. <laughs> McWright wants, wants to pick it up because he knows if he picks it up, he can get in there for a touchdown. Keeps rolling around. Took a little bit longer to get this one off. A little slow snap. Now he takes a one. See, oops, two. And there he is. There comes McWright across the good block. Laid out. Just the way the coach is teaching. You go not, not where he starts from, but where he's going to punt the ball from. He laid out right across that foot. And, of course, they went back to Kevin Ellis punting. Ellis had not uh, 
putted the last two or three times. But he and Sean Wilson have shared the job tonight. Well, TCU just trying to salvage some points here. And there's the Mr. Punt Block himself. He put his high school ball with Dallas Roosevelt. Giles is the quarterback. He's got a, a power wishbone formation. Giles keeps it. Touchdown, TCU. got that zero off those turnovers for the uh, Aggies. Well, they've told us officially they aren't, they don't credit that as one. The block kick is in its own category. It does the same thing. I guarantee you every coach in the country counts as a turnover. <laughs> well, it does the same thing, doesn't it? All <laughs> right. <laughs> those statisticians might not, but every coach, <laughs> high school, college, and pro counts it as a big turnover. <laughs> Well, the extra point is good, and it is 37 to 7. A&M leading TCU with 5.36 to play here at Eamon Carter Stadium. Well, you'd have to say that the goal of the Southwest Conference football teams, including the Aggies, were off to a good start tonight each year is to get to the Mobile Cotton Bowl Classic, which symbolizes the Southwest Conference Championship. Through the years, there have been some great games. In 1965, for example, Frank Royal's Razorbacks defeated Nebraska 10 to 7, and the Razorbacks then finished number two in the country. Well, each week, HSE presents Mobile Cotton Bowl Classic highlights Wednesday nights at 10.30, plus Saturday mornings at 10.30. Wednesday night's show is going to look back at the 1965 game, the one between Arkansas and Nebraska. That's Mobile Cotton Bowl Classic highlights twice each week on HSC. And, of course, the shows not only have the highlights of the game, but also the pageantry as well. Eight turnovers for TCU tonight is the most in the Jim Wacker era. RC is a little bit unhappy about that punt block. It's just something about having punt blocked that upsets coaches. Well, and that's the thing we talk about. You know, fans are saying, well, this game's over. It's just like in basketball, the so-called garbage time. Coaches do not acknowledge that such a thing exists. Well, and, no. Uh, and really, that's what we are in the equivalent of somewhat here in, in this game. But coaches cannot <laughs> acknowledge that that exists, even though there is a psychological letdown. Well, and even though he had his, you know, most of his backup second players in their defense, but he wanted them to do well in that goal line stand. He's unhappy with the fact that they scored so easily. He's also unhappy with his special teams that you get a punt block because that invites your next opponent to do the same thing. All set for the kickoff. Philip Keeler will actually kick off this time, number five, as he's getting set to put it down to, well, Darren Lewis is one of the return men, but he's not going to take it. Horton will to the 30, 33, 34-yard line. Larry Horton. Horton had a 92-yard opening kickoff return versus LSU to start the season. This one not quite so shy so long. He had five kickoff returns for 103 yards versus Washington. Not much tonight because they haven't had to return many kicks. Aggie fans want to know about this uh, Texas A&M call-in show with R.C. Slocum. Well, it's going to be a happy Sunday night this week, 9 o'clock. Your opportunity to talk with the Aggies head coach every week live tomorrow night at 9 o'clock right here on HSC. the best run of the night for Keith McAfee. Yeah, they got a new quarterback in there. Kent Petty is in there at the quarterback now. Tell you a little bit about Petty. He is a 6'3", 208-pound redshirt freshman from Dallas. You know, our is aware of where some of these guys are from. He's getting them in the game, the ones that might not ordinarily see much action. McAfee makes the turn. He's got 23 yards now. Number two ball carrier tonight. Well, he just lost some. Slippery turf. 
No, he slipped before. Now, I'll tell you one thing. I, I guarantee he's got tape around those shoes. Uh, you can see the tape from up here. And when you wrap tape around the bottom of your shoes like that, it eliminates the little bit of, of uh, cleats that you have on them. All of them play with those rubber cleats on the Astor. But now he has given himself extra ankle support by having that tape wrapped around that shoe. And that one of the reasons he's slipping is because of that. Second down, 15. Yeah, it doesn't leave much space on the bottom for gripping. Here's Brian Ross. And there goes Brian Ross to the 31-yard line. Larry Brown wraps him up. Ross, the senior from San Angelo Central, the tight end, rambles on the catch. Well, we talked about that, and again, I guarantee you, the coaches talk about that tape. This is a good play here. Petty goes back to looking downfield. And see, so you say, why he's throwing? Well, this guy wants to throw the ball, too. You want to give him the opportunity to see what he can do. Good catch. Now he turns it upfield. Shows a little speed, Ross does. <laughs> that was a good play, 27 yards for Petty. McAfee had a nice hole at the line of scrimmage, but it was covered up by the defensive backs and linebackers, and so he didn't get too much extra. Richard Booker, the linebacker, was the first man to hit him. They talk about that tape, Greg, on those shoes. Now, a lot of times, players will do that on their own. The trainer doesn't know that they do. They don't particularly want them to do that because they know that that's what will happen to those shoes that they'll slip with them because there's no traction there. Second down, six. Gets down to about the 18-yard line on a nice spin move. Well, Greg Lakin in there, an offensive lineman, doing a good job. Carter, another Dallas player, so he's up in the Metroplex, putting on a little bit of show, getting some playing time. Jason Rockhold, number 59 in there. Number 63, Wally Hartley. Well, the other thing about that is you're giving us experience to these folks that might have to play if one of your regulars gets injured later on in the season. McAfee to the 10, out of bounds at about the four-yard line, and it is a first down. Jason Pommel drove him out. You know, we can uh, go a little bit more on that point you made, Ed, because the really good teams, the powerhouses, as we take a look at the play, that they're able to do that. They're able to play a lot of people. Well, and that keeps fresh people in there, and then when someone gets hurt later in the season, you got someone who's not inexperienced, and they accumulated. You know, these are underclassmen. You're talking about freshmen and sophomores are playing now. That's just great experience for, for next year when they have to step in there. First and goal from the four. Carter to the one. It also is why with some of these real strong teams that are winning big margins uh, every week, you look at the number of returning starters and it may say they don't have many, but that's misleading because the guys that played behind them got a lot of playing time. And that's exactly right. It is second and goal from the one. Well, let's see. Carter, McAfee, Petty. Fumble. Petty has to pick it up and try to salvage it. Third and goal. We have had more mishandled snaps tonight. Yeah, you, you don't expect it from your regulars. You kind of expect it a little bit with these kind of folks that haven't had much chance to play and they're, they're anxious and maybe haven't taken that many snaps in practice with the center that might be in there. Less than two minutes. Sweet right. McAfee doesn't make it. Fourth down and goal. Backed up by that interior defense. Linebacker Richard Booker putting some extra pressure in. Ivory Christian. Yeah, this would be a morale boost if TCU could keep the Aggies out of the goal uh, area here. Let's see. It's fourth and goal. McAfee, touchdown a &M. A 
38 yards for McAfee and a touchdown. So out of that uh, same position, the tailback slot, Lewis and McAfee have shared it tonight. There's a good shot at. They've had over 80 yards rushing and four touchdowns. Starts inside and takes it. A little bit of a cut back there, takes it in, and there's RC on the sideline. Well, you're that far ahead, doesn't get too excited about it. It is 44 to 7, Texas A&M, with one minute and six seconds remaining. See if we can go back. See how long it's been since they've had that kind of points on the scoreboard against them? Uh, well, last year, well, la of course, last 18 year. 18 to nothing last year was. Last year, I was looking more on the other side. The last time the Aggies scored huge, and they, they scored huge a couple of times last year. 56 against Louisiana Tech and 50 against Texas Tech. It was a nice, long drive, one of the longer drives. A shot of Jim Wacker on the sideline, and in his heart and mind, he knows he's got a tough job facing him the early part of next week getting his team. But he has a good job with that. He'll bring them back, and they'll be ready to play against Southern Mississippi. Very optimistic, very upbeat. Knows he's got a lot of young players playing, and they are playing a little bit of a disadvantage, whether people realize it or not. They've only got 74 scholarships right now because of some of their earlier problems that they're still suffering from. Most of the other schools have 95. That was a 10 play drive, 67 yards, took five and a half minutes. McAfee capping it with a one yard run, 44 to seven with a minute six. They'll let that one go through the end zone where TCU will come out and put the ball in play with a minute six to go. Trailing 44 to 7. Yeah, we're trying to see. Last year, of course, the game was a shutout, but it was 18 to nothing. Clay is back in at quarterback for TCU. TCU has actually been uh, pretty good in home openers. Not tonight. Boy, they're fighting for that one. They're doing something. Steve Lofton to the 35-yard line. Whoa. That was a real wrestling match for the ball. And Lofton came out with it. Another interception. Another turnover. Nine. Now, let's take a look at the interception as he had to fight off Todd Holmes. A little bit of contact down here by the defensive back into him, but he did a good job of going up and taking away. Did a pretty good job of running this ball back. 17-yard return by Lofton, and it's first down. Little Steve up from Alto, Jr. McAfee cannot turn the corner as he's banged out of bounds. No, I don't think he can cut. <laughs> <laughs> Not with the shoes he's wearing. Huh? No, he's got to he's he's get it. <laughs> See, his mother will listen to this telecast and he'll say that guy on the analyst was all over you about your shoes. <laughs> you have too he'll, much tape on him. He'll say, maybe he was right, Mom. I'll check it out. 44 to 7. They let the uh, cleats poke through. <laughs> Second down. Nice effort. You know, he's, uh, Carter's been uh, impressive in the small action that he's seen. Well, now the walking wounded. Yeah, that was on that uh, uh, reverse play. Radbury. At that angle where he was uh, coming across on the uh, reverse play and got tangled up with his, uh, with uh, Fraser. And they may be doing a precautionary thing. They're keeping his weight off of it. And put that ice on top of it. And they're going to let the time run out. That was the last play of the game. There's yeah, Washington, of course, going down the sideline. And when you lose, those injuries are a lot tougher. It's over. The final score, Texas A&M 44, TCU 7.
Welcome to TCU Football with head football coach Jim Wacker. Today's show is brought to you by the Coca-Cola Bottling Company of North Texas. Coca-Cola Classic. Can't beat the feeling. Radio Shack, the technology store, America's leader in consumer electronics. Blackman Mooring Stomatic, carpet, furniture, drapery, and air duct cleaning. Delta Airlines, Delta, we love to fly and it shows. Dr. Pepper Bottling Company of Texas, Dr. Pepper and TCU, just what the doctor ordered. Jack Williams Auto Mall, Highway 80 and Loop 820 and West Fort Worth. Ashworth Insurance, for your peace of mind, we're always there. TCU would also like to thank the following sponsors for their support. Malcolm Loudon and Howard Walsh, Jr. Max Eubank Roofing. Bruce Alford. Union Pacific Resources. Curtis Nooner. And Southwest Land Title. You've heard of the nightmare on Elm Street? Well, I'll tell you what. Last night, it was a nightmare in Eamon Carter Stadium for the Horned Frogs. I mean, it was a disaster. You know, we wasn't like we did everything wrong. Man, we'd have a couple of nice plays, and then all of a sudden, boom, disaster would strike. At times, I promise you, it was uglier than a Freddy Krueger doll. First down in 20. Giles from his own 34-yard line. Quick drop. Out of the pocket. Throws it high. Right to Nowak. Good catch by the freshman from Duncanville as he jumps up at the 50 between the Aggie linebackers and makes the reception so they get the 10 back and six more. Second down and about five for the Frogs. Near midfield. Middle of the field against the Aggie 3-4. Fake the handoff. Giles in trouble. Gets away from Price. Now has to escape Webb. Does. Flips it out to Blackwell. Far sideline down to the 40 and a first down. First down at the Aggie 40 at the far hash mark. Moving right to left. In their home purple. A lot of TCU fans disappointed tonight, and Giles fumbled a snap, and an Aggie falls on it at the 46. It happened again. But if you think that was bad, when do you see this next one? First and 10 at the 20. Option reverse. Morey has it. He can fly up to the 25, 30, 35, 40, 50. He may go all the way. One man to beat. Cuts back at the 30 and finally drops at the right at the 30-yard line. Behind center, Giles fakes to Morey, rolls out right, looking for a blocker, has Morse in front of him, and flips it to Kelly Blackwell at the 15 down to the 13. Now it is third down from the 19. Giles, short drop, throws it over the head of Morey, intercepted by Frazier, two yards deep in the end zone with one hand. Some days, I guess, it's better if you wouldn't have gotten out of bed. I promise you that game against the Aggies was kind of that way. You know, when you look back on it, the mistakes offensively, uh, they were incredible. We end up with nine turnovers to zero for the Aggies. Now, that's just not supposed to happen. Part of it, you got to give credit to Texas A&M. I promise you, there was some good hitting out on that field on both sides of the ball as far as defense was concerned. And a couple of them were genuine knock looses. That first hit on Michael Jackson after a catch, uh, hey, that's a knock loose. That's going to happen once in a while. But what really bothered me was the execution. Boy, we cannot have those fumbled snaps and drop the ball when we're going back to pass and uh, fumble snaps under a handoff between the running back and the quarterback. Now, I know, you know, you can point to injuries and you can say, well, you know, boy, Tony Dothard was down and then Cedric Jackson, his replacement was down, our two senior running backs. Then we had to go with true freshmen. Hey, that's just excuses. We've been out there practicing day after day. And the one thing you've got to do if we're going to win football games is execute. The offensive line, the quarterback, the running backs, the receivers, everybody. We have to execute. We can't have drop passes. We can't have fumbles. We can't be throwing interceptions. We can't have fumble snaps. Because those types of mistakes will destroy you. And that's exactly what happened Saturday night. Did you get it? Did you get Bobby Valentine? Fooled me. 
Late last night, just before 1130, a little history was made up on the hill. Down by 16 points with five minutes left, Mike Romo brings the Mustangs back against Connecticut. And with two seconds left, dumps this pass off to Michael Bowen. And SMU had beaten Connecticut 31-30 to for their first win since the death penalty. And joining us live now is the guy who made the catch, Michael Bowen. Michael, what was it like for you last night after that catch? Oh, it was total jubilation, Ted. Um, it was just a great feeling on the field. It was probably one of the greatest feelings that you know, I've ever experienced on the field. Now, you know, they're tearing down the goalpost. This against a, a, a lower division school, an NCAA 1 AA school. What does that say about uh, SMU? Just that you guys are that excited about the win? Well, we were, yeah. The fans, we had great fan support. They were very excited. It was a great victory for us as a football team and for the whole program in itself, and as well as uh, for the alumni and the fans that supported us through this whole ordeal. Michael, you caught nine passes last night. I wanted to take a look at, at, at one before that. What brought you back? What do you think did it? Was it these kinds of catches, these clutch catches? Um, yes, um, I think, you know, any time you know, as a football player, you like a challenge. Um, and this is the ultimate challenge, being put in a situation like this. Here we go. Romo, who was injured in the third quarter, just wouldn't give up, would he? No, he wouldn't. He made a great read on that final pass. He, uh, he made that play happen. He uh, made the read. The intended receiver was covered. And uh, he just uh, made a great read and threw the ball in the end zone. Well, he was about six inches from going over the line of scrimmage, wasn't he? Yes, he was. What kind of a quarterback is Mike Romo? Oh, he's a great quarterback. He's a very smart quarterback. He reads the defense as well, and he can put the ball where he wants to. Is this what SNU needed, even though it was against the one double-A school? Oh, uh, yes, it's very much what we needed. Um, like I said before, it's a great uh, great thing for, for our school and our program. I, I, Forrest Gregg was crying on the sidelines last night. Was he crying at practice still today? Oh, no. It, we kind of came back to reality today at practice. And I understand you had to work a little bit. Yeah, right? we did. We worked very hard today at practice. We're ready for Texas. You are ready for Texas? Yeah, huh? we're, we're, we're ready to prepare for him. Let's put it that way. Okay, Michael. Thanks for the visit. Congratulations. Believe me, you brought some history up to SMU. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Michael. Tip it to Smith, and they have it at the 15-yard line, and that's the second turnover of the quarter. They'd already put the points up on the scoreboard, and here's Pavlis under pressure. Two men blitzing. He throws it out and beats one of the TCU linebackers to the corner, and I believe that is Darren Lewis with a touchdown for Texas A&M, first and 10 at the 32. Giles, hands off for Motkins, fumble, Aggies got it at the 31. The freshman Motkins and the senior Giles never made connections, and Terry Price falls on it, and that's another turnover. Double tight ends, one of them in motion. Lewis at right tackle, touchdown Aggies. New quarterback in the game for TCU, Leon Clay from Gladewater, Texas, and the snap is fumbled and recovered by the Aggies at the nine-yard line. Second down from the four-yard line, Pavlis option play. Lewis will walk into the end zone. From four yards out, Frogs were surprised. It appeared by that option, and Pavlis worked it to perfection, and the Aggies score again. He has receivers left and right, Maury and Dickens. One setback, hands it, and Motkins fumbles the ball, and William Thomas falls on it at the 41. Curtis Motkins acted like he didn't want the football that time, or it was a bad exchange between he and Clay, two freshmen, and they weren't even close. And here's the 32-yard field goal attempt on the way. It's good. Aggies tack on three more. First down at the Aggie 40 at the far hash mark. Moving right to left in their home purple. A lot of TCU fans disappointed tonight. And Giles fumbled a snap and an Aggie falls on it at the 46. It happened again. All right, it's just for bragging rights right now. Fourth and goal at the one. The game's out of hand, but the Frog defenders want to stop them here. A man in motion. I formation. Lewis up and in the end zone. Touchdown a and &M. I'll tell you one guy, for the first two ball games, he has dominated almost on every snap, and that's Fred Washington. You talk about a great player. 6'3", 280, really runs good, but more than anything, what Fred does is compete. He comes off the ball hard every play. He plays hard every play. In two games, he's had 20 tackles, 
four sacks, who knows how many pressures, he's totally dominated the opposition. I was assigned to go watch him play in his championship game his senior year. And uh, I was told to watch a couple other ball players on the team, and this one kid kept standing out. He was just all over the football field. Played tight end and defensive end, and he totally dominated the game. And I came back to the office after that and uh, asked, uh, asked the question, what about number 88? That's the guy we need to be looking at because I really, I really thought he was a, a football player at the time. Some people don't achieve the type of things that Fred has achieved, but um, you know, through hard work, you can always get better, you know, especially in, in an area of such a strength and conditioning. And Fred's definitely done that. You know, he came here weighing 218, 220 pounds, and now weighs well over 280 pounds. And he's done all that through just hard work. About the first three or four weeks of school here, I, you know, I'd outgrown all my clothes. I had to buy, you know, different clothes and everything. But after that, you know, I started liking it and I started really getting into it. When he came here to play, he didn't say very much. He wasn't, wasn't very much of a talker, but he approached everything with intensity. It didn't matter whether he was going in the weight room or whether he was coming out on the practice field, whether he was matched up against somebody at the time that was much larger than he was. He was a student of the game, and he's a, he's a very intense football player. He competes the way the game is supposed to be played. Fred definitely gets the best out of you, I think. Uh, when you go against Fred, you know you're not going against an average defensive lineman, you know. You've got to do everything right, you know, and occasionally Fred will beat you. You just got to, you know, you just take that in stride, but, you know, when you get the best of him occasionally, it feels pretty good because you know you've really accomplished something. He's been a tremendous uh, inspiration to our football team. You know, his work habits, uh, his dedication to the game, his dedication to this football team, uh, uh, to see that it uh, succeeds has, has been extraordinary. And I think it's been a, he's been a great role model for all of our players. It's always kind of funny, you know, that you know, the guy base blocks you, and, you know, he can't do it. And you look at him and just laugh or, you know, make a tackle behind the scrimmage and, you know, laugh and joke around with other players. You know, that's always kind of funny. You know, I never really try to talk a lot to anybody, you know, but I like to, you know, I don't feel like to laugh and joke around. And, it's that crazy. Have fun. Play the game like supposed to be. Every young player has got to have an example. They got to know how to play this game and how to play it at the pace it's supposed to be played at to be successful. And, and uh, Fred is a great example for our young football players. They see how the game is supposed to be played and how it's supposed to be played right. Winning, you know, that take care of that. You know, take care of everything. You know, I feel like you know, if we win, then you know, all the hard work I've done, you know, that's behind me. You know, it's easy. You know, it just seems like you know, it's worth it. Third down and 10 at the 20. Keeper under pressure, flushed out, and hit and sacked back at the 15-yard line. Fred Washington got him. 11. 11. We'd like to have all 11 of our players on the field playing like a Fred Washington. If we do that, we'll, we'll be fine. As tough as that game was Saturday night, hey, we did have some guys on the defensive side of the ball that really played that really played hard. I've already mentioned, obviously, Fred and Daryl Davis and some of those guys, Roosevelt Collins. But a couple new faces. You know, Buddy Wyatt went out last week with an injury. This week, John Marsh went in there, and boy, did he ever play good, dominating football at that other defensive tackle spot. We had to have John come through. Just one week ago, he was playing off as his line. And another young man, Brad Smith, for a great, outstanding freshman linebacker for us. We think he's as good a youngster as we've ever had in here. And in the third play of the game, he goes down with a neck injury. On comes a true freshman replacing a redshirt freshman, Ivory Christian. And Ivory ends up one of the leading tacklers in the game. He's all over the football field. And for a youngster just, uh, you know, about five months out of high school, I'll tell you what, he did awfully well. Pavlis in the I formation pitches to Lewis. Lewis caught at the two-yard line by Lavoyle Crump. The junior from Mount Pleasant comes up hard to stop A&M's All-American from getting in there. And in fact, he loses a yard. Wide splits by the defensive line. Play action fake by Pavlos. Under pressure. Roosevelt Collins chases. John Marsh got him. For a five-yard loss and a sack. John Marsh, the sophomore from Santa Fe, making his first college start after playing both ways last week. He's playing in place of the injured Buddy Wyatt and showing us something there. And here's a second down and about nine from the 32-yard line. Aggies have a lone setback, and this guy, Lewis, from Dallas Carter, gets the football, but hey, not much there. Greg Moore and John Marsh meet him at the line of scrimmage, third down and seven. 
the 45 yard line. Pavlis looks and then hands off to Wilson and he smothered. Lost three yards. High formation, middle of the field. This time they hand it off to Randy Simmons, the junior from McKinney, and not much available to him at the right side of the TCU defensive line over there. John Marsh and Roosevelt Collins among the tacklers on the play. First and 10 at the 40. Aggies still need 60 yards to go. They run a trap play at left tackle and pointed Robert McWright. Check that Jason Cobble come in from the left side and Stephen Conley from the right to meet the ball carrier Simmons for a three yard loss. After the five yard flag, here's a third down and call it about seven. Long, deep retreat for Lance Pavlis, completed and then hit Cornelius Patterson, drops the ball, and will they say it's a complete or an incomplete pass? They say it's an incomplete, never had possession. He looked like a pinball in a machine down there between three frogs, and it's an incomplete pass in a punting situation. They're a long way from 100 yards rushing tonight, and here's Fred Washington breaking through to sack Pavlis back at the 29-yard line. Daryl Davis, says Pavlis fumbled the football. I don't think Lloyd Dale, the referee, agrees with that, but here is Fred Washington, who had a sack last week, comes up with another one well, tonight. Frogs have Ken Walton in the game at a defensive tackle. A lot of substitutions for TCU. Here comes Roosevelt Collins, but they flip it over the middle, and their intended receiver is Garrett, and he was plastered immediately as he caught the ball by LaVoyle Crump. Second and eight, McAfee in trouble. John Marsh makes a fine play in the backfield to bring him down for a yard, maybe a two-yard loss back there. Daryl Davis also in there quickly. Britton at the 34 of TCU. Low snap, and Robert McWright blocked it. He'll pick it up, or try to. The ball is loose at the five-yard line. Frogs finally get it at the two. Robert McWright blocked Kevin Ellis's punt. Ellis was the punter. And the Frogs fielded at the two-yard line. Encouraging. That was specialty team. We had a young man, Rex Roberts. The last four years, he's been playing on the soccer team here at TCU. The last time he punted in a football game was one punt in the seventh grade. He never played all through high school. He never played all through college, and as a fifth-year senior, he decided to walk on. He decided to come out. And yesterday, he got his chance to be the starting punter. And boy, what a job he did. He averaged right at 40 yards a punt, and I mean time after time, under tremendous pressure from those Aggies, he got that ball out of there. The other thing, kick coverage. We had a lot of guys really working hard to give him protection and then getting down under those punts. The other encouraging thing, a couple pretty good returns, Charles Britton in particular and Larry Brown. Boy, they coming back in, back on that particular part of it. So again, if we continue to get better defensively, especially teams, now get that offense rolling again, we're gonna be fine. Here's Rex Roberts again from his own 16. The Aggies rush and almost got it, but Rex gets it away. And here's Shane Garrett with a fair catch back at the 33-yard line. A 20-yard pass to Robert Wilson. And a 23-yard field goal by Lane Talbot. And the Aggies set up for the return this time and Rex Roberts gets it down to the 16 Shane Garrett takes it there he goes north south and gets it to the 30 yard line a gain of about 12 on the return moving right to left they rush the ball almost got it but Roberts gets off a nice kick that time Garrett will fair catch the football back at the 25 yard line so Robert stands at his own two-yard line, so watch the Aggies come on the rush. Nope, they'll break it back and try to set up a return and a booming punt for Roberts. It's a little low. Garrett will get an opportunity to run it back. He circles to the 40, the 42, 43. Greg Moore caught him there at the 44-yard line after a 54-yard punt. Philip Keeler kicking off for the first time tonight from his own 35-yard line. Larry Horton returned one 92 yards in the opener and here he'll get another chance from two yards deep Horton breaks left and he is cut from behind by Jason Cobble and a knuckleball kicked here by Keeler fielded by uh, Larry Horton at the 19 yard line and out to the 34.
by jumping out of the frying pan into the fire, boy, well, that's what we got to do this next Saturday. Because we got Southern Mississippi coming to town. The boy Curly Holman, the new coach there, has he done a great job. Last year, they're 10-2, and, and in a bowl game, they win the bowl game. Great win against UTEP. This year, in their opener, they play Florida State, the number five-ranked team in the nation, and they knock them off. Now, the last two weeks, they've had a couple, couple tough games. You know, Auburn, they're a pretty good football team. They just get beat by. But I know this. They got a quarterback by the name of Brett Fair. Boy, he's a great thrower, tremendous poise, and our secondary is going to get tested once again. But I really believe that defense is going to rise to the occasion. I believe this, too. Our offense knows they can execute a lot better than we did Saturday night. We get a challenge again to prove just what kind of football team we can be in 1989. Now, that just can't be talk. That's got to be performance. We've got to have some young men go out on that football field and believe in themselves and believe in each other and go execute and go make the plays and go get it done. And that's what we expect to happen. I really believe you're going to see a couple of quarterbacks come back more determined and tougher than ever, Ron Giles and Leon Clay. You're going to see some young running backs. Hopefully Cedric Jackson will get back and be healthy again. But if not, you don't worry about those freshmen. A couple of those guys, hey, they're going to be good, good football players. We're just going to keep working. We're going to keep believing in each other. We're going to keep improving. Now, it's going to be this week in Heyman Carter Stadium again at 7.30. It's going to be Southern Mississippi University. There's going to be a great tailgate again, party again, playing by the Alumni Association, okay? And it's going to be a pregame tailgate party, and we hope you come for the festivities. Again, support the Horned Frogs. We need your backing. Thank you.